And so right there is the account number and this here underneath is the routing number and I Yep, that's me getting account and routing numbers to facilitate ACH transfers and account verification. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Well, it all started when I added Plaid Auth to my app and I'll show you how on today's episode of Plaid Academy. So let's talk Plaid Auth. At its core, Plaid Auth gives you two small pieces of information, routing numbers and account numbers or their equivalents in other parts of the world. But these two bits of information are a key part of important tasks like money movement or account funding. If you're looking to transfer money into or out of a bank account, at least here in the US, and you know, sorry international folks, but this tutorial is gonna be pretty US focused. Yeah, that's right. You're gonna be using something called ACH. ACH, which stands for Automated Clearinghouse, was created back in the 70s and is used for all sorts of bank-to-bank -bank transfers. Everything from direct deposit to social security payments to, yes, adding funds to your favorite fintech app. And when it comes to identifying what bank account to put money into or take money out of, you'll need two important pieces of information. The routing number, which is used to identify the bank we want to connect to, and the account number, which is used to identify the specific checking or savings account within that bank. Now, for obvious reasons, it's important to get these numbers right. More than that, you want to be fairly confident that they belong to an account that your user is supposed to have access to. This is where the name auth in Plaid auth comes from. It's, you know, not a login system or anything. You're authenticating this data and taking steps to make sure that it's valid. Now, by itself, auth does just these two things. Helps you make sure these numbers are correct and that they belong to an account that your user has access to. If you want to go further in terms of protecting yourself against fraud, I would recommend looking into balance, which will give you a real-time update on how much money your user has in their account, and identity, which will let you know the name of the user associated with this account. You can combine that with something like identity verification to make sure the person using your app is the same person as the one who owns this account. But you know, those are topics for other videos. For now, let's show you how to implement auth. For this video, I'm going to be working with a sample application that's running Node.js on the back end and plain old JavaScript on the front end. And I highly recommend you code along with me. You're going to learn a lot more that way, I promise. And you know, don't worry if you're not super experienced in either of these technologies. As long as you have a solid engineering background and a reasonably up-to-date version of Node running on your machine, you should be okay. Now, before we get started, I'm going to assume you already know some of the basics of how to work with Plaid. Like you already have an account set up at the Plaid dashboard. You know how to generate a link token and open up link. You know how to exchange a public token for an access token. And you know the difference between like the sandbox and production environments. If you don't, I would recommend checking out the getting started video and then coming back to this one. It's okay, you can go ahead and pause this. I, uh, I get paid by the hour, so it's fine. So to get started, we're gonna head on over to the tutorial resources repo on our GitHub page. You can find the link in the description below and I'm just going to copy this line here. Next, let's open up a command line window, head on over to your favorite folder for downloading GitHub projects and git clone this repository. We'll jump into the tutorial resources directory, get into the auth directory, and then into start to get to our starting app. We'll run npm install to install all the proper packages and wait a few moments. And then the next thing I'm going to do is configure our app with all the proper values. So I'm going to copy .env template to .env. Then um, I'm going to open up this directory in VS Code, but you know, feel free to use whatever IDE you like. Next, let's edit our env file. I'm going to copy over our client ID and secret from the Plaid dashboard. I'm sticking with the sandbox environment and you should probably do the same. Let's leave our user ID at one for now. And then let's talk about this webhook URL thing. Now this is optional, but there are a couple of times here when our application will be making use of Plaid webhooks. And in order to expose these webhook endpoints to the world without publishing the rest of my application, our backend has a separate server just for receiving webhooks running on port 8001. And because I have ngrok already installed, I can go back to my terminal window and run ngrok HTTP 8001. And that's going to set things up so that any request to this crazy looking domain here gets forwarded to my local host on port 8001. So I'm just going to copy and paste this domain name back into my env file. Now, if you have no idea what I just did, one, don't worry. Like I said, this part's pretty optional. It adds a little automated magic to our app, but you can totally work around it just by clicking a few more buttons and I'll show you how. But two, I do recommend checking out our tutorial on Plaid webhooks, where I go into more detail on what webhooks are, how to interpret them, and how you can use ngrok like I'm doing here to test them while still running on localhost. 
Finally, the last optional step is that I set up this application based on the assumption that you're only going to retrieve one account per institution. It simplifies our code a bit, but also probably reflects what you might realistically want to do when you're setting up off. So if you want to enforce the one account per bank rule in link, uh, you can do that by following this URL here. This will take you to the Plaid dashboard where you can customize your link flow to only allow the user to pick one single account. So first I will click on this create new customization drop down here, say that this flow applies in the United States for English users, and I will give this custom link flow a name like say auth single account. Next, I'll change this option from multiple accounts to one account, and you'll notice we go from check boxes to radio buttons here. I'll click publish changes and then copy that link flow name into here. Now, when we use link, it will make sure to use this custom link flow that you've configured in the Plaid dashboard. Again, this is optional, but if you don't do this, just try to remember to only pick one account when you connect to a bank. All right, with me so far? Next, let's get our application up and running by opening up another terminal. I'll just do this in VS Code and running npm run watch. If all has gone well, uh, you should see a message that your application is up and running on localhost 8000. If this is not working, I would recommend making sure you have a somewhat recent version of Node running. I am currently using Node 16, which is the latest LTS version at the time of this recording. And I recommend you have something similar. Oh, and if you plan on working with Node a lot, I also highly recommend installing NVM, a utility that makes switching between Node versions a whole lot easier. Okay, next let's open up localhost 8000. And here is my test application that does some of the basics around fetching a link token. Specifically, it creates a link token, lets me open up link on the client, then sends the public token down to my server, where my server exchanges it for an access token. In fact, let's just do that. I'll click this connect my bank button, connect to my favorite bank. I will add user good and pass good as my credentials, select a single account and we'll get connected. And when this is done, you can see that my application has written out a little JSON file in this user files folder where I've recorded my access token. Just to avoid the extra overhead of having you run a database, I'm just writing out everything in a little flat file like this not a scalable solution, but good enough for teaching purposes. So if we open up our server code, we can also see that I've made a little call to retrieve some recent transactions from this account. That's what all this test data is. And my application currently has two working buttons here. This refresh user status button simply retrieves that JSON file that I have stored on my machine for the current user. And then calling accounts get makes a call to this get account status endpoint here on my server. Now my server here is using Plaid's node client library to make this call for me. Up here is where I initialized my client library with our client ID and secret to make sure those get sent along with every call we make to the API. This data gets sent back up to my client and it is printed out on screen. Incidentally, I'm doing this client work by routing all of my calls through this little call my server function, which talks to the server, handles errors, and spits out the results of every call I make to the console. Again, most of this should seem familiar to you already if you've ever set up a Plaid application before and gone through one of our quick starts. And if you haven't, I will once again recommend watching our full getting started tutorial first before you proceed any further. All right, with all that under our belts, let's start getting some actual auth information. Okay, so first things first, let's open up server.js and head on over to our generate link token code. And uh, here in the products array, I'm going to replace the product transactions, which, you know, was really just a placeholder with auth. That'll make sure when we connect a bank with link, we're set up to use the auth product and we are able to retrieve the appropriate information. Next up down here in our swap public token endpoint, I'm going to delete this little chunk of placeholder code that made a call to that transactions endpoint. This was really just to make sure we had something working. And then I think next I'll go back to our ENV file and change our user ID to something else. It doesn't have to be a number like this. It can be a string. So I think I'll call my user instant auth. If nodemon is running correctly, this should automatically restart my server with this new user as our, you know, quote unquote, signed in user. So if I reload my client page, I am asked to connect to a bank again. So we'll go through this flow one more time. We'll skip ahead here. And after I'm connected, everything looks mostly the same. But if I make a call to accounts get, you can now see here that in my list of products, I have auth enabled. So that's good progress so far, but let's actually get that auth information. And my client up here in my check connected status function, and this is a function I call when a user is done connecting to their bank with link, let's enable the section auth connected. And so now when I reload my client, I have two new buttons to click. Ooh, very exciting. All right, so let's look at this first one, the one to get some basic auth information. Right now, clicking this button calls the empty function get auth info on the client. This will need to call an endpoint on our server to fetch this information. 
So I will set my auth data to await, call my server with the endpoint of server slash auth. And then I'll call show output with this data. And this is a JSON object, so let's you know stringify it. And this will display whatever I get back in the blue rectangle on screen. So if I were to reload my client and run this, you can see I am getting back a to-do message because this endpoint hasn't really been implemented on my server. So let's handle that next. Uh, let's jump down here to where my server slash auth endpoint is. And I will say that my auth response is equal to await plaid client dot auth get. And I'll need to pass in my user's access token. Uh, in my case, I can get that just by looking at the user record that's loaded into memory with the access token field. Again, in a real app, you're probably going to need to query some kind of user access token database. Anyway, I will say that our auth data is equal to that response data. And then let's just console.durit. This is like console logging, but I think it prints it out in a slightly better format, particularly if I set colors to true and depth to null. So um, we're not returning anything to the client yet, but you know, let's just save this file anyway and make this call again so we can see what data we're working with here. All right, so um, up here is my list of accounts. Here's my account name and some interesting info, as well as an account ID that represents an internal identifier generated by Plaid for this account. Item here displays some information about the item. Remember, an item is basically Plaid's connection to this institution. And then down here, numbers is the data we're really interested in. It's broken up into several different arrays. ACH contains the numbers needed here in the US for the automated clearinghouse. And then we've got like BACs for numbers in the UK, EFT for Canada, and international for many international banks. Now, each one of these arrays will contain different objects. Since I'm working on a US only product, my ACH array is the only one that's filled out. And I can see that right here is my account number. And right below that is my bank's routing number. This account also has a wire routing number, which is a routing number used specifically for wire transfers. I think you're less likely to use this one, but in case you do need it, here it is. Now, if I connected to more than one account with this bank, you would actually see multiple objects in here, each one with an account ID that corresponds to what's in the accounts array up above. Oh, and by the way, don't confuse this account ID with the account number. The account ID is Plaid's internal identifier. There will be many times, and you'll see this later, when we'll want to refer to an account without knowing the user's account number. That's what the account ID is used for. But in terms of money movement, it's this account number here that we care about. So I could return all this to our client, but uh, let's try and simplify this a bit. Maybe we'll just like return the account routing number alongside a human readable description of the account. Although I should probably note, you don't actually want to do this in a real application. If you want to show this information to a typical end user, you want to show them this mask number and not the actual account number for various reasons that I won't get into. I'm only sending this information up to our client so we can make sure these endpoints work. So I guess it's a, you know, do as I say and not as I do kind of situation. So to get that working, we'll need to link up the contents of this ACH array with what's in the accounts array. So let's set up our simpler output. I'm going to look at our auth data dot numbers dot ACH array and map these objects to some simplified data. Let's see, we'll grab the account number and the routing number. Uh, let's also grab the internal account ID, which you know our user doesn't really care about. But this might be useful for, say, populating the internal values in a drop down list if we wanted our user to select from this list of accounts. And then we'll go ahead and grab the user friendly name by finding the corresponding data in the accounts array above, something like this. And this will give us an array of all of our ACH numbers. We could return this object back to our client in JSON form, although since my app is assuming we're only connected to a single account, let's return the first value in that array. And uh, I think that should do it. So I'll save my changes. Again, my server automatically restarts because I'm running Nodemon, and I can make this call again from my client. And uh, look at that. There's my account by name alongside the account and routing numbers that I'd want to use for ACH transfers. And we know these values are valid because we retrieve them from the bank directly. Now, for a lot of you out there building some kind of money transfer solution, your next step would be to send this routing and account number to your payment processor. This is somebody like Dwala, Move, Treasury Prime, and so on, who would then file the actual ACH transfer request on your behalf. But I know that for a lot of developers out there, you'd rather not handle this information directly. Account and routing numbers are considered pretty sensitive information, and that comes with a whole set of security and compliance concerns. And uh, I think maybe some of these payment processors won't even let you give them this information directly. I'm, I'm not sure. So another option is to create a processor token. Basically, Plaid has partnered with many of these different payment processors 
to establish a system where instead of giving you account and routing numbers to pass on to your processor, we will send you a token, basically a big old random string, that's designed to be sent along to that specific payment processor. That processor can then send us a request to retrieve this information using this processor token. And, you know, once we verify these requests are actually coming from the proper Plaid payment processor partner, who say that three times fast, we can send them back the account and routing numbers, and you as an app developer never need to touch this information. So to create a processor token, the first thing you'll want to do is head over to the Plaid dashboard and select this integrations dropdown and enable the specific processor you're currently working with. I'm going with Dwala, but you know, they're all great. Just find the one you're using and click this enable button. For most of these processors, enabling them is instant, at least on the Plaid side. Next, let's complete the functionality for creating a processor token in our app. So first, let's go to the client and we can find this get processor token function. I will let my processor token equal await, call my server, and we'll hit the endpoint server slash processor token. And then let's just call show output with a nice little debug message to put that up on screen. Okay, under the real functionality, which is on our server, let's head over to the server slash processor token endpoint. So we'll set our processor token response equal to await plaid client dot processor token create. And I'll need to pass in both our access token and our specific account ID. Again, this is plaid's internal ID for the account, not the account number. Now this account ID is something that I stored as part of our user record. I did that back inside this fetch account ID call, which I called up here when we exchanged our public token for an access token. So I have this already. And so I can just, you know, grab it like this. And then we'll need the name of our processor. I will type in Dwala and uh, well, that's, that's about it. We'll return the data from this call. We can call save, reload our client. We'll make this call. And you can see what we get back is a processor token. And this is something we could then send over to our payment processor in lieu of an account and routing number. Again, Dwala or whoever you designated could use this token to fetch that info directly from Plaid. Now, how you send this information to your payment processor is going to vary depending on who your processor is. So I will have to refer you to their specific documentation from here. But to be clear, this would be another server to server call from your application. Honestly, there's no need to share this processor token with your client like I'm doing now. I'm just doing that so it's easier to see what our call actually did. And this basically works with all of our partner payment processors, with the exception of Stripe. With Stripe, you'll need to do a little more work when you first connect to them through the Plaid dashboard. And then the call itself has a slightly different name. It'll be processor Stripe bank account token create instead of just processor token create. But that's pretty much the only difference in terms of the API call. And if you're working with a payment processor that we haven't partnered with yet, hey, that's fine. You can keep using them. You'll just need to send them the user's actual account and routing number. So this process, which we call instant auth, covers a little over half the banks in the US. But because it includes most of the larger banks, this actually covers about 90% of the bank accounts that your users are looking to connect to, which is great, but we should still cover those remaining 10%. So let's tackle those next. So if your user's bank doesn't support Instant Auth, the next fallback we recommend is Instant Match. Basically, in these situations, Plaid is able to receive some portion, usually the last few digits of the user's account number. So we then ask the user for their full account and routing numbers. If the values that the user enters matches the mask that we've received, we'll consider these numbers as valid. Now, implementing Instant Match is actually pretty simple. In fact, by the time you see this video, you shouldn't have to do anything to enable it. It'll be turned on by default. So we can test this right away. I'm going to go into our env file and change our user ID to instant match. This will uh, reset our server with a blank user. And then I will reload our client. We'll connect to a bank. And this time, let's search for the special test bank, Houndstooth Bank. This represents a bank where Plaid doesn't get the full routing and account number. So we'll need to fetch it in a different way. Once again, enter user underscore good and pass good for your credentials. And then pay attention here. Make sure you select Plaid Savings, not Plaid Checking. Once you've connected, you'll be asked to supply your routing and account numbers, and you can copy and paste those values from here at the bottom of the screen. Click Continue, and uh, that's it. We're done. Plaid has confirmed that these numbers match up with the partial numbers that it received, and our calls to AuthGet and Processor Token Create work exactly the same as before. And I didn't have to do anything extra to get this working. Now, these two approaches by themselves will cover a very large majority of banks and therefore bank accounts in the United States. 
But let's look at a couple more ways of verifying accounts in case Instant Auth or Instant Match doesn't work. The next approach is something called automated micro deposits. So for some banks, Plaid might not receive the full account number, but it can view recent transactions from this account. So what Plaid will do is ask the user for their routing and account numbers. Then it will send a small deposit to the account that your user specified. Plaid will send it using something called same day ACH, which means depending on the time of day, this deposit will be transferred in one day or less instead of the two or three days that a normal ACH transfer requires. Plaid will then start looking for this deposit among your user's transactions on a pretty regular basis. Once we find it, we'll mark this account as verified. And if we don't find this transaction after seven days, we will give up. So to get this working, we're going to go here where we're setting up our object to generate a link token. And I'm going to add in another key value pair here. The key will be auth and the value will be an object where I can configure a few flags against how auth behaves. Specifically, I can set automated micro deposits enabled to true. I'll go ahead and create a new user. Let's call them, I don't know, auto micro. And then we'll go through the process again. Once again, select Houndstooth Bank, but this time I'll add user underscore good as my username and micro deposits underscore good as my password. And yes, it takes me several attempts to type this correctly. This time, go ahead and select your checking account. Oh, by the way, if you're wondering how I know what bank and what account to use, it's here in our documentation in the auth ad institution coverage test and sandbox page. That'll be listed in the description below too. Anyway, back to my app. Once again, I will enter my account and routing numbers, copying them from down here. I'll also select a personal account, but I'm not sure if that matters. And then I will also enter my name. This is something that will be required by ACH when using micro deposits for real. But for now, you can basically just type any old name here. I'll finish up the process and it'll tell me that my account should be verified in about one business day. So uh, that's pretty good. And uh, we are back in our main screen again. So uh, let me once again fetch our auth numbers and well, we get an error. Specifically, the error message we're getting back from our server is that the requested product isn't ready yet, which, you know, if you think about it, totally makes sense. I mean, one business day hasn't passed yet, so our account has not yet been verified. And so, of course, we shouldn't be getting back any kind of auth information. But from our user's perspective, I suppose it's not a great experience to allow them to make this call and get an error in the first place. I'd like to proactively prevent them from making this call or anything associated with it maybe with some kind of nicer messaging until their account is ready. So how can we find out that their account is ready to receive auth calls? I suppose one way would be to just make this auth get call and uh, see if I get an error or not. Certainly easy enough, and I suppose in some ways the most accurate, but I think there's a more elegant approach. Let's take a look at what happens when we run accounts get. If we take a closer look at our data, you'll see that our account now has a new value on it. Specifically, verification status is now pending automatic verification. Well, that seems like a pretty good way of knowing our account status. So what I'm going to do here is change up our app so that after our user is done connecting, we'll take a look at accounts get and store the value of this verification status field as a separate field in our user record. In fact, if you take a look, you can see I've set up this field in our user JSON object as this auth status field. I just haven't actually saved a value here yet. What I'll then do is I'll have my app query the value of this field and give me like some appropriate messaging depending on the situation. So let's go into our server and fill out this refresh auth status function. First things first, I'll make a call to accounts get. We'll say that accounts result equals await plaid client dot accounts get with our access token that um, has been passed into this function. Now, as you recall, this will return an array of accounts that are associated with this ID. And I suppose I could just say that account to analyze equals account result dot data dot accounts zero based on the assumption that my app is only retrieving one account per item. Although if we really want to be safe though, we could make this like accounts.find where the account ID equals the account ID that we've got stored with their user record. This is probably safer. Next, we'll await update user record where we will set our field auth status equal to the account to analyze field verification status. And uh, this almost works, except that if our account is successfully verified using instant auth or instant match, the two methods we've defined earlier, this value will actually be null. Honestly, I think it's kind of weird that this is null instead of like verified or something, but that's what it is at the time of this recording. So what I'll do is I'll add like a nullish coalescing operator to say that if this value doesn't exist, we'll go with verified. This operator, by the way, was added in node 14. It's great. So uh, now we have a function that looks up our auth verification status and sets it in our user record. 
Let's go ahead and call it at the appropriate point. I guess one spot would be right up here where we swap our public token for an access token. In fact, it looks like the call is already there. Let's just uncommon it. But let's also add the ability to call this manually. There's a few times when we might want to do that. So let's go find this refresh auth status endpoint, and we can have it call await refresh auth status, passing in our access token, and then let's just have it return, you know, updated true or something, so we know it's done. Next, let's go into our index.html file, and this is the one and only time we're going to touch this file. And I'm going to go ahead and remove this display none class from our refresh auth status button to make it visible. Then in our client, we'll say that refresh auth will equal await, call my server, and we'll call server slash refresh auth status with the second argument of true to make this a post call because that's how we set it up on our server. Once that's done, we'll make another call to await refresh user status, which should fetch the updated JSON object that includes our new value for auth status. I know there was a lot, but let's save everything and reload our client to see our unhidden button. We'll click it to make the call. And if we look at our JavaScript console, here's our updated user record with an auth status equal to pending automatic verification. So just a reminder, what we did is we made a call to accounts get, fetched the verification status field from our account, set that value in our user record, and then retrieved our updated user record. And this is pretty good progress, but you'll notice our UI is still acting as though we were verified and it's still letting me make this auth get call and receive an error, so let's fix that. So basically the reason this is happening is here in my check connected status call, I was just kind of making the assumption that if you're connected to a bank, we can enable auth connected, which we now know isn't true. You could be connected to a bank, but still not yet verified to make an auth call. So here's what I'm going to do. Let's remove this call to enable that section of our app. And instead we'll make a call to display auth details with our connected data dot auth status value. And then down here is where we can update our app's UI depending on this auth status. So first off, just for kind of debugging, let's show this value in our auth details div. Next, let's grab reference to our more details div so we can add text to it later. And then we can add a switch statement depending on that auth status value. So if it's verified, as you recall, that's the value we set if our verification status was null, we can tell the user that they are ready to go and we will enable our auth connected section. And let's make sure to break. Next up, if we are pending automatic verification, we can tell our user to come back in 24 hours and we'll enable another section of our document on this automated micro section. And I'll tell you a little more about that in a moment. Now, once 24 hours has passed and our user is verified, our verification status should be automatically verified. If that's the case, let's display a nice message to our user and then we can go ahead and enable our auth connected section again. Finally, if seven days have passed and Plaid still hasn't found a record of the user's deposits, our account's verification status will be verification expired. In this case, our user will basically need to connect again and create a brand new item and link. I'm not really gonna cover this case in our tutorial, but at least let's tell the user their account failed to verify. And with that done, the one last thing we'll need to do is make a call to display auth details at the very end of our refresh user status call. Okay, that was a bit of work, but I think we've got a better UX now. So let's reload our client. It'll fetch our user status from our database. It'll see that we have an auth status of pending automatic verification. It'll give me this message here on our page and then enable only this middle section while keeping our top section disabled so we can't make any calls to auth get. Okay, so great progress so far. Now, just to close the loop and verify our account, all we need to do is wait 24 hours. At that point, our account will be marked as verified in Sandbox, and we can go ahead and make all of our usual auth calls against it. But personally, I'm kind of impatient, and I don't really want to have to wait that long. That's why I added this I'm feeling impatient button. Now, right now, this works on the same principle as a closed door button in an elevator, which is that it doesn't actually do anything, but maybe it makes you feel better if you keep clicking on it. But you know, let's make it actually do something too. Now, obviously when you're out of production, there's not much you can really do to speed this up, right? Like ACH transfers are gonna move at the speed of ACH transfers and you know we can't really do much to change that. But right now in Sandbox, when we're dealing with all fake data anyway, we can tell our Sandbox environment to pretend as though that transaction had gone through. So first let's start by adding this functionality to our server. We have this endpoint Sandbox force auto deposits and what we're going to do is we'll have a set status result equal to await plaid client dot sandbox item set verification status. 
Now this takes in three required arguments, the access token, the internal ID of the account we're verifying, and the status that we want to set. So we can grab the access token from our user record. We'll grab the plaid account ID from our user record as well. And our verification status is, oh gosh, uh, this giant enum name dot automatically verified. And if your IDE isn't auto-completing this for you, uh, you could also just set this to the hard-coded string automatically underscore verified. And uh, that's it. We'll return a little something so we know we're done. And that's really all we need to do. So to hook it up, let's jump into our client code and we can have this force auto deposits function call uh, await, call my server, sandbox force auto deposits. I'm just going to copy and paste this endpoint to make sure I have it right. And we'll make this true because it is a post call. So let's reload our client and click this I'm feeling impatient button. Okay, looks like our call went through. And if we tell our server to refresh our auth status, this runs accounts slash get on the server and fetches our new auth status, which is automatically verified. So our client once again enables this top section here where we can go ahead and fetch auth data like before, which is great. But you might have noticed we had to tell our server to intentionally uh, refetch account slash get, which, you know, is fine. That's a common way of dealing with this situation. Maybe you'd run a cron job or something to do this for any account that's still waiting to be verified. But if you are receiving webhooks on port 8001 through ngrok, you might have also noticed here in the logs that we are receiving this automatically verified webhook from Plaid alongside the account ID and the item ID. So if we want to get fancier or, you know, at least be able to respond to our user a little quicker, we could just directly handle this webhook. So I'm going to jump down to our handle auth webhook code in our server and let's add a case for this automatically verified webhook. Now, because I'm not actually taking the time to verify the content of this webhook, I think rather than blindly trusting the fact that this account has been verified, the safe thing to do here would be to run auth get on this account ID and get the updated status right from the source. So that's what I'll do. I'll go ahead and grab our access token from our signed in user, which honestly only works right now because my server only supports one user at a time. If this were a real application, I would use our item ID to look up the associated access token. And then I will go ahead and call refresh auth status. This will update our user records auth status with whatever it gets from Plaid, which should be automatically verified. Then all we need to do is have our client update itself. Again, in a real app that probably involves web sockets or polling or React query or something similar that I didn't really feel like implementing. So for now, we'll just rely on our user clicking the refresh user status button. Actually, I suppose this is a bit of a hack, but here in our force auto deposits function, let's just call refresh user status after a timeout of say three seconds. That should be enough time, at least here in Sandbox, for our server to receive the new webhook, make a new call to accounts get, and update our user record to note that this account is now verified, and then refresh user status should grab that new JSON file. So just to show you everything working, you don't need to follow along, but I'm going to try this again with one more new user. We'll go through the whole process again of connecting to Houndstooth Bank, go through this micro deposits flow one more time. Then I'll click the I'm feeling impatient button and do nothing for a few seconds. And you can see that my auth status has now been set to automatically verified and this UI is now enabled. Okay, that is one more auth method taken care of. Now, before we move on, I should probably note that both automated micro deposits and instant match do a great job of covering banks that you can't normally get through instant auth. Like I think in both cases, you'll go from like over 50% of the banks in the US to like well over 90%, I think. And given that large number, it means you're going to see a lot of overlap between these two alternate methods. If it were a Venn diagram, it would probably look a little like this. So while many developers can and do implement both kinds of auth, you could also implement only one of these backup methods and get nearly the same amount of coverage. Now, you'll notice that instant match was a lot more convenient from a user standpoint. Yes, they do have to go and look up their account and routing number somewhere. But after that, they are able to authenticate their account and move on right away. And I'm sure that you know, in terms of reducing churn and hitting all of your conversion metrics, having an onboarding process where people are able to fund their accounts immediately instead of waiting 24 hours is a huge difference. That's why Plaid generally resorts to instant match first as a backup solution. And so given this Venn diagram here, this means there are only going to be a few instances in the real world where your app will resort to automated micro deposits if you have both options available. It'll happen with a small number of banks and in a few kind of rare fallback instances. On the other hand, instant match does still allow for the possibility that a user could enter an incorrect number if the digit they enter incorrectly isn't one that's included in the mask. 
Now, in practice, we found this doesn't happen very often. It's more of a theoretical concern than an actual one. But if this is a major concern for you and you are willing to take the conversion hit from having your users wait 24 hours, you could always explicitly disable Instant Match and rely solely on automated microdeposits as your backup. Like I said, bank coverage is pretty similar between the two. Personally, though, I think it's best to keep both of these options enabled. I mean, at this point, we've already done the work, so why not? Okay, so we've got a lot of the banks in the U.S. covered, but we still don't quite have all of them. There's a small number of banks out there, particularly small regional ones and credit unions, who simply aren't in Plaid's system at all. Because these banks tend to be small, it generally corresponds to a pretty small number of users, but still, it would be nice to support them as well. So what can we do? Well, this is where we jump into our last authentication method, same-day microdeposits. Now, same-day microdeposits works in a similar manner to automated microdeposits. The user enters their account and routing numbers, and Plaid makes two small random deposits in the account that they've specified. The difference here is that Plaid can't automatically check for these deposits. Remember, Plaid basically can't get any information from these banks at all. So instead, we have to ask our user to verify the value of these deposits. Now, if they are able to correctly identify the amounts of these deposits, then the account is considered verified and we're able to give you the account and routing numbers that the user specified earlier. If they get it wrong three times, then verification fails. So let's give this last method a try. To get started implementing same-day microdeposits, you're going to want to add same-day microdeposits enabled true to your auth object when creating your link token. Oh, uh, one note here, if you are going to start using same-day microdeposits, you have to list auth as the only product in your products array. Again, because we're using this to interact with banks that Plaid otherwise has no connection with, it kind of makes sense we can't include other products like, you know, transactions or identity. Let's go ahead and create a new user. We'll call them same day and uh, reload our client to connect to a new bank. So to test same day micro deposits, you want to click this link with account numbers link, which you can get to either by scrolling all the way down to the bottom here or just enter a search string up here that doesn't match with anything. If we click on this link, it will guide us through the same day micro deposits process. Again, in Sandbox, you're going to want to copy your routing and account numbers from this bar down below. We'll say it's a personal account, enter any name you want. And I don't think this matters, but I usually stick with checking because I'm too lazy to change it. I'll click Authorize to allow Plaid to make these deposits and subsequent withdrawals. And uh, we're done. Now, if you look at our logs, you'll see that link is still going through the normal completion flow here. That is, I receive a public token, which I send down to the server in exchange for an access token, which I'm storing with my user. And that's important for reasons you'll see shortly. After a moment, we'll get back our updated auth status here, which is set to pending manual verification. Uh, gee, looks like I haven't actually handled that in our switch statement. So let's do that now. All right, so I'll jump into our client code, head over to our display auth details function. And uh, we'll say that if our status is pending manual verification, then we'll display a message to our user telling them to come back in 24 hours. And we will enable the same day micro section of our page. So we'll reload our client and we can now see this section enabled. Now we have one important button to implement here and two buttons that are labeled as extra credit. Let's handle this big one first. This is the button that our users will click on to finish up verifying their micro deposits. Now, in order for this to work, we'll need to run link in update mode. If you haven't heard that phrase before, link in update mode is basically when our user has to run link to provide additional information against an existing connection. This is most commonly used when a user changes their password and they need to re-enable the connection, but it's used in several other situations as well, this being one of them. So to verify our micro deposits, we're basically going to run link again, which means fetching a link token from the server. So uh, let's start with that part. I'm going to jump into our server code and head down to this generate link token for micros endpoint. Well, let's start by copying and pasting the code for generating a normal link token from our generate link token call. Then we'll make a few changes to it. First off, we need to set our products to null. Um, I think an empty array works too, but I prefer null. Next, we need to specify our existing access token. This is how Plaid knows our link token applies to an existing connection for our user. And uh, we'll remove this off block as well. This isn't needed. And uh, we should be all set. Now, my code for running an opening link is here in ConnectJS, specifically this start micro verification function here. So what we can do is set our link token data equal to call my server with the server slash generate link token for micros endpoint that we just finished implementing with, again, a second argument as true because it's a post call. And then we'll call start link to open up link with this new token. 
Now we just need to hook up this call to our button. So here in Verify Micros, you know, we can just call await start micro verification. And uh, I think that's it. So let's reload our client and give this a try. So I'm going to click our Verify Those Deposits button. You can see that it requests a link token from our server and then opens up Link. And because this is running Link in update mode against our existing access token, Link knows that it needs to complete the microtransaction process. Now I will mark down one cent as my first deposit and two cents as my second because that's how you verify things in Sandbox. And I am verified. Because I'm using my existing Link code with its associated on success handler, my client still goes through the process of sending out the public token it receives to our server in exchange for an access token. But honestly, that's not really necessary. I get back the same access token as before. However, this code on my server does also call refresh auth status, which means my new status of manually verified is written to my user record. And then my client code already calls check connected status, which in turn calls display auth details, which means that my auth status of manually verified appears up here in the client, which is great. But I guess it looks like I didn't handle that situation in my switch statement over in display auth details. But, um, you know, basically I can just add this to the same code block as automatically verified since all I'm really doing here is thanking the user for their patience and enabling the auth connected section again. While I'm here, I happen to know the failure state is verification failed. So I'll put that down here with verification expired. So when I reload my client, it'll see that my auth status is manually verified, which means it will enable the auth enabled section, which means I can once again fetch auth numbers from this bank and create a processor token. So uh, three things about the process we just implemented. One, you'll notice that same day micro deposits involves more friction than these other types of auth methods. Not only does our user have to manually enter their account and routing numbers and remember to come back in 24 hours, but we need to make them perform some additional work, right? They have to go and click another complete my verification process button. They've got to go like sign into their bank in another window so they can find those recent transactions and hunt down those micro deposits and then manually enter them in here. Two, remember that because our user hasn't signed into their bank at all during this process, Plaid has no other information about this bank besides the fact that it has these routing and account numbers and our user has access to this account. And this means we can't use other Plaid products against this bank. Like we can't call balance to fetch the user's real-time balance and we can't call identity to get the name and address of the account holder. And so you do need to be careful here. Some of the fraud protection capabilities you would normally get from calling balance and identity aren't available to accounts verified in this way. So, you know, you might want to take some mitigation steps, like maybe you restrict how much money user can transfer out of this account, or maybe you have them use a product like identity verification, not to be confused with identity, to find out who's really using your app. And finally, you might have noticed that in Sandbox anyway, we were able to verify your deposits right away. This is a bit of a quirk of the Sandbox environment. In a real application, your user won't see their micro deposits show up in their bank for like a business day. Which leads to a follow-up question, is there a way of knowing for sure that these deposits have been placed in a user's account so we can send that user like an email or a notification to complete the process? And the answer is kinda, but it gets a little involved, so I'm saving that for a separate video to be released later. Uh, if you want a preview, you can go ahead and take a look at the code for these extra credit buttons in the finished directory in our sample application. Uh, but for now, just know that like waiting 24 hours and then sending our user a notification is pretty common and honestly what a lot of our customers do without any other fancy code. And so with that, we have handled all four methods of verifying and authenticating a user's routing and account numbers. And just to recap, those are instant auth, which grabs the numbers directly from the bank and is the fastest and most accurate approach. Instant match, which grabs partial numbers from the bank, asks the user for their account and routing numbers and compares those to the partial values we get back. It's also very fast, but does involve more friction on the part of the user and runs the risk, at least theoretically anyway, of getting some incorrect numbers. Automated micro deposits, which asks the user for their account and ID numbers and verifies that it's able to make one small deposit to this account, a process that takes about 24 hours. And then same day micro deposits, which asks the user for their account and routing numbers, and then asks the user to come back and manually verify that we're able to make two small deposits to that bank. Now, out of all these methods, same day micro deposits takes the longest to complete, generally has the highest friction, and again, doesn't give you access to products like identity or balance for protection against fraud or overdrawn accounts. But it does offer one other advantage, which is that users can connect to their banks without having to enter their account credentials anywhere. 
And this can be helpful if you think your users aren't comfortable with entering their banking credentials, or you know, maybe more importantly, your users are working with business accounts where they might not necessarily have the credentials needed to log in. And so there are some cases where developers prefer to give users the option to connect using same-day microdeposits up front, even for banks where a user could otherwise connect using one of these other flows. Now, if you are one of those developers, you can enable this option by adding auth type select enabled to the auth object in your link token. If you do this, your user will get the option to verify instantly using one of our other methods or manually using same day micro deposits. Again, this isn't really an option I'd recommend without knowing why you're adding it. Same day micro deposits is kind of the least favorite of my auth methods for all the reasons I stated earlier. So, you know, in fact, I'm going to leave it out of our sample app. And there we go. Just about everything you need to know about auth. Of course, make sure to check out the documentation for anything I wasn't able to cover. And hey, why not let me know in the comments below what other tutorials you'd like to see. Thanks so much for watching and making it through the end of this very long video. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't yet. And happy platting. <laughs>